Hi, my name is Thomas Coppola. I'm a three-time entrepreneur. In my last company, we took from zero to 100 million revenue in five years. And I spent two and a half of those years trying to figure out how to share data between my team, my employees, and auditors, customers, vendors, suppliers, everyone else that I had to share data with. So this is a problem that we end up spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on. Dozens of people go through the same thing. I ended up selling the company to a private equity firm. I never solved the problem. So after I sold that company, I did a lot of research and I started to really think about how to solve that problem and how, how we can better think about trust and aggregate, right? This is a problem that everyone has to deal with because trust used to be in a single organization, right? I hold a perimeter around all my stuff all my stuff's in some data center somewhere. I have one, one port of egress and ingress. I can control who touches it, who uses it, what they do with it. Everything was done inside the perimeter of a single organization. And I trusted my employees. I trusted the people in my organization. There was never the thought that somebody would, would do something malicious or some, somebody would, would snoop around the inside of my organization to take data, to give it to other people or pirate or sell or what have you. But then as the cloud really expanded, right, not just the internet, but really the cloud, all that changed, right? So suddenly we have to leave ports open and we've got to connect to different cloud databases and all your employees are in SaaS applications and you don't know what half your employees are doing half the time. So suddenly everything, everything was everywhere and everybody wanted access to everything all the time. And then how do you really manage that, right? And so what I realized was the cloud architecture as we know it today has fundamentally broken the back of traditional security, right? And, and all the websites have become data driven. Everything we do now is connecting to some, you know, simple front end that's all data driven on the back end that has to be connected to real time to all the data and all the resources and all your PCI because, you know, that's the best customer experience, right? And so the more I drove the more I drove into startups and other businesses, the more I realized the magnitude of this problem. And, and I began to look at the question of, you know, how do we share that data, all those libraries of information, which is so important to our organization, but how do we share it in a way that we know it's properly handled, shared securely and managed appropriately, right? So how much easier would it be if we could if we could enable external parties to access your internal data exactly where you have it. If, you've, if you have your stuff stored in some EC2 bucket, why can't you just somehow give really secure access to some third party to that EC2 bucket where you don't have to move anything, right? So what if you had a single pane of glass that controlled access to applications, documents, services, and you used it to govern both employees in your workplace as well as users outside your organization, but with the same security and effectiveness? That, that's the question that we posed as a team and we tried to figure out how to answer. And we asked ourselves effectively three simple questions. How do we determine the absolute validity of identities at the organizational level and then be assured that those identities are true and accurate to represent that identity outside of its owner's organization, right? So everyone today has an IAM system, everyone has some sort of IDP, whether it's LDAP, Azure AD, Duo, Okta, what have you, right? So we figured that out as an industry, but then, and it works great inside the workplace, but how do you, how do you create portability among those identities? How do you take identities that are known to your, your internal workplace IAM system and use them or extrapolate them and still, still have the efficacy to know that they're certain outside of their organization? That's the first question we asked. Once we figured out the identities question, we began to think, how do we use those identities in a cross organizational manner to co-author policies between organizations, right? You can write policies day and night, and all of us have done this, where we write policies that govern the workplace or, or the workers within our organization. But now I want to invite someone outside my organization to access documents inside my organization. And so how do I, how do, I do that effectively? And ideally, I would co-author a policy. I would de I would determine the, the 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 heuristics, the specifics, all the parameters that were critical to my security architecture, and I would tell those to that third party, and then I would create conditions, additional parameters that that third party would have to adhere to. Right. So you've got to be uh, use your work email. You've got to be on your your uh, a, a, a work 
lap, a work desktop, or maybe you only can be on a laptop, or maybe you can only do it between business hours, or maybe it has to be from a, a US-based IP address, or whatever. You can come up with 100 different parameters that would fit your security architecture based on your own your own your needs and issues, right? So how do we co-author policies between two disparate organizations so that we can control access to assets inside of our own organization? That's really the second question that we asked. And the third question we asked was, once we're, if we can create dynamic policies that are co-authored between two different organizations, then how do we ensure a hierarchical understanding to ensure that only the right people have access to the right data and the right assets at the right time? So that, that, that even though you have multiple parties co-authoring a policy, potentially with multiple IDPs involved, that we always obey the owner's rules, the, 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 the owner of the, of the asset, of the data. So how do you create a hierarchical structure between the, the identities and the, the architecture of the applications to know that only the right people are accessing the data as described or as demanded by the owner of that data? That's the third question that we pose to ourselves. And so what we did or what we came up with was something that we call federated trust management, which really in a simple terms is a summary of the who, the what, and the how anyone, internal user or external users, are accessing data and resources that we, the owner of the data, control. So we talked a little bit about the who, so let's go back to that. For us, the who became the IAM, the IAM industry is a $13 billion industry. Uh, Azure has you know, really figured out how to federate workload or manage workload identity federation. Um, federated identity is super popular today. Everyone's at least running LDAP. And so um, you know, uh, the who for us always becomes that whatever corporation, whatever company's single source of truth, whether it's an LDAP, an IDP, an external party like an Okta or a Duo, what have you. That's the easiest way to manage the who. Then we build hooks to be able to take that who from other organizations and pull those, those tokens and information that we need out of those JWTs so that we can use it to create what would become like almost an avatar, right? An avatar of that identity, but in, in our own platform. The what go, always goes back to the author of, of who's controlling the asset. So it could be a service, an application, a data store, um, anything that you can put behind so any kind of API. And so the, the what is always focused from the point of the owner of the asset. What does the owner of the asset control and how does he want to share with other people? And the how becomes the third piece, right? Because people today, everyone works remote, everyone has multiple devices, everyone is mobile. It's very hard to control those people. And so we enable customers to, to, to create heuristics around um, how people are accessing that data. And you can come up with dozens of parameters from the time, the geo's fencing, the hardware used, the specifics, the terms, the read, write, the control, can I download, can I copy, all of that. And so there's a, there's a whole set of tools today that we look at that everyone's familiar with to control or to create parameters around how people can access that data. Once we, once we figured that question out, then we started to figure out, wow, if we could actually, if we could actually co-author dynamic policies between multiple parties, not two, not three, could be five. But if we could co-author dynamic policies between multiple parties, then we got this, this crazy amount of benefit all of a sudden, right? We had clear visibility for all permissions under a single pane of glass, right? We, we, could, we could reduce the workload of sharing critical data inside company A and, and allowing company A to share that data with company B or C or D or what have you in, in hours or minutes, let alone days and weeks that it would normally take to create the connections, the this, this standardized connections between multiple organizations. Federated trust enables customers to define granular rules around who, what, and how people can access their critical data and asset services, applications, what have you, 
while always maintaining absolute control over the entitlement rights surrounding that data. And that word control is the key because with federated trust, you gain control, you gain visibility, and you can do it at an exceptionally lower cost than you would um, really any other solution we found. Federation, federated trust extends an organization's IAM system to both push and pull contextual intelligence related to one's organizational identities and then use those identities to co-author policies that were governed also in another organization. So we simply become almost a middleware platform where you can exchange keys because it's all about aligning the token requests needed to access whatever application or service you're trying to dam demand to. Your IDP is still going to be the single source because any, any, any application in your organization is always going to go to your company's IDP. The key is that we help that company's IDP reach outside of the extensions of that organization so that we can, we can create better JWTs, better better JWTs with more information about both the auth n function, the access function, as well as the auth z function, the authorization function. And by combining all that data in the same JWT, that when it gets to the application, then, then we have a much more granular effect on the application for what people are allowed to do or not do with that application and what data they are or aren't allowed to access, right? So it's important for, for technical people because creating trust across boundaries solves this this intractable problem which today has been solved candidly by the enterprise crew but you know the enterprise applications today that solve this start in the hundreds and go to the you know multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars and for us it was unrealistic i'm a startup guy right so my whole universe is startup people and you, you got 10 people in a two million dollar budget you're you're, you're not going to spend you know, $250,000 on, you know, federated trust across sale point or whatever else you have to figure out, right? You, you need a simple way to tap in your LDAP or Google or G Suite or what have you and be able to federate trust across boundaries, right? Um, what we did was create a platform that enables people to do that very, very seamlessly by using all the same tools they have. Half the people we, we, we work with simply use LDAP, and that's fine because we can stack that behind an API. We can use your LDAP as your single source of truth for your, for your employees and your identities and still be able to pull that forward and co-author policies written into block, um, which I'll talk about in one second. So for us, for, for guys in the startup community, federated trust is the only method to do it because it's super simple, super cost effective, and you can create these cross organizational workflows in literally minutes. You can write policies with two, three, four, five other parties, just let them sign off and, and accept that. Everyone hits the same parameters and you can do that and it takes 20 minutes, not you know two days or two weeks. So for us, we view it as critical that we have to build ways for information and assets, including access to applications and APIs and everything from workstations to IoT to be able to be trusted across organizational lines. Today, we talked to dozens of prospects who, who have you know, IoT devices that they need to share information with regulators or they need to share information with their suppliers or vendors. And taking that speci those specifics of data in real time basis and, and extrapolating it and then starting to kind of collate it to share with people outside their organization is, becomes this monstrous disaster to do. And so we, we keep telling people, Leave your data inside your organization, wherever you have it and wherever your employees are used to getting at. Worry about the focus of having absolute certainty over the policies and the parameters that are used to allow external parties to access that data. It's a very, uh, it's a very Google Beyond Corp approach, but it works amazingly well. Um, I, know, I know that now, that if we need to share a library with a partner, that the authorization that they get access and use and process that information is based on something we can trust, even across organizational lines, because we co-author the policy and we're using verify, verifiable identities to manage the access to those resources. So how do we do it? And it's this is actually, you know, it sounds pretty simple. It, it is pretty simple. We write dynamic policies, which we didn't invent. HashiCorp, OsoPolar, OPA, Styra, the guys at Styra are very good at writing dynamic policies. So we write dynamic policies, but we write them to block 
And we combine that with the use of verifiable identities to create what we call federated trust. So we asked earlier, and we talked about the verifying the identities of the people or, or the parties that are requesting access, it always comes down to, to a, a, an individual's IEM system or IDP provider. Right? It's that simple. And it's a great place to start. And people invested a lot of money in the IEM framework today. So we just, we leverage that, right? We also talked about, you know, how to create immutability or how to create certainty around those policies that we're writing around co-authorizations. And as you guys know, um, a lot of the work in the Hyperledger universe today allows you to create chains and co-chains and sub-chains. We do the same thing. We simply use Hyperledger fabric to extend instances of block between one party to another, and that way they can co-author policy, which is then going to be written into block. So it creates a phenomenal analytical trail. It's phenomenal for your auditors. It's phenomenal for compliance because you can predefine from a compliance standard everything that you have to have happen. I, I know that my company's PCI compliant. Okay, here's the 18 things that all of your policies have to conform to as it relates to accessing data around those PCI parameters. So you can pre preload in block everything that you're gonna to have to do in, in order to create a policy that's gonna that's going to grant people or deny people access around those PCI assets. So you get right up the curve way quicker and by doing it in block, you get this immutable record between all the parties of what's happened and more critically of everything that's not happened. So for us, every time there's a request to access a piece of data, it hits block. It's, we evaluate the policy in real time against real time parameters. We, we check all the other external metadata and parameters that we have to do that's gonna be able to fulfill that policy. Once all those things click, we issue a request token to the user that they can then hit the application. So it's like real time dynamic authorization and authentication of every user every time to every asset based on policy that's written in block that becomes immutable. So you get <clears throat> this fantastical audit trail of everything that has and hasn't happened around the data in question. So when you go back to your auditor and you say, you know, let's discuss my PCI compliance and you, and you wanna talk about who has and hasn't accessed your PCI data, you have this fantastical record of every request that's hit the block since then and all the parameters surrounding it, which creates great analytics for your compliance and regulatory framework. So um, we use blockchain, we use simple templates, and we use policy as code. Policy as code where you can build everything in your infrastructure today around, um, you know, everything is policy as code. Security as code is finally getting there. Um, we're not the only ones to do it. There's four or five good, good, really solid players in the marketplace that are doing this today. But if you're building infrastructure as code and you're building application as code and you're building services as code, you've got to figure out how to start writing policy as code and security as code to really match the dynamic capabilities of your policy and your authorization and your authentication systems, which should match the scalability the the dynamicism of the rest of your infrastructure as it relates to scale, particularly in like retail apps, consumer apps, um, uh, anything anything that has a hyperscale back back end, <clears throat> which is scaling in demand to the front end. So, for us, <clears throat> excuse me, for us now, if if I if I have a vendor who I have connected to an API but wants to send me malicious data that I'm not I'm sure about that doesn't happen. You know, could a prime contractor on our contract pull data from our source code database? You know, no, because everything's only going to be read only. Our data is always under control, even once we've given it access to someone else, because everything is on a time based short term token, which has expiration rates predetermined by my policy rules and my compliance standards. So federated trust is all about controlling access and authorization with plenty of abilities to limit that access and even cut it off. And it's easy. We have customers that are highly, highly regulated, highly, highly secretive. So you get access tokens that are good for minutes, seconds sometimes 
And if anything is not right, they'll simply cut access to the data rather than rather than bend or make exceptions. It's good in some cases. It's frustrating in others. So how does it really affect information security? Well, red team testing for us got a lot more interesting, that's for sure. And blue team testing got a little bit easier, though, right? So with a centralized source of authorization, blue teams can feed that data to a seam. Or they can use any products built in analytics functions to filter and sort and look for anomalies because it's really centralized authorization, which is managed in a distributed manner. Right? That's the power of block. By tying dynamic policies to block, it gives us the ability to have a single source of truth as it relates to policies, but it allows us a dynamic distributed method and different, and different policy decision points to enforce those policies. So again, compliance becomes a lot easier because, because a centralized source of authorization with immutable transactions and distributed consensus, you have a fantastic way to get wonderful analytics out of the system. Right? There's no there's no way to tamper with the single source of truth. You also have great visibility into the access and who's doing what and who's touched what and on what terms. So for companies which 30 years ago were single celled organisms, you know, living in a in their castle of a parameter where they could control all their data and knew what their users were always doing, right? Now it's time to really move past that, right? This is what federated trust is all about. It's time to build pathways and trust among functional subsystems between your, your parties and different vendors to, to enable a more seamless sense of functionality, not just for your customers, which is always the, the paramount, but really for employees, especially in today's distributed workforce. Right? We have to have federated trust. We have to build ways for information and assets, including access to applications, APIs, workstations, etc., to be trusted by and across organizational lines. Right? That's the key to what we have to do. I think that we have a great approach to it. I'd love to talk to anybody in more detail about how we do it, the specifics of how we write to block, how we use Ledger, and how we build trust across boundaries in an in an organizational way. Thank you so much for your time and attention. I appreciate it. My name is Thomas Coppola. I'm the CEO of Secure, and I appreciate your time and attention. Thanks.